Even rats will get obsessed if you alternate kindness and feeding with abuse and isolation. So it isn't any wonder that people who grew up with trauma would have a tendency to fall in love even harder when the people who five se seconds ago were saying they love you suddenly kick you out the door. Non-traumatized people recognize this as abuse by an unstable and selfish person. But people with childhood PTSD, we will fixate 100% on getting them back by any means necessary, including deluding ourselves. My letter today is from a man I'll call Roger, and he writes, Hi, Anna. I'm a 40-year-old man in love with, or at least long-term limerent over, an unavailable 33-year-old woman. I don't know how to break these chains. All right, Roger, I've got my fairy pencil. I'm going to circle some things that you tell me that I want to come back to. But I'm going to go through. Let's hear what's going on in your life. He says, I'm a good guy syndrome. Anxious preoccupied, whose mother was OCD anxious and a helicopter parent. My dad was a cheating alcoholic who my mother kicked out when I was seven with very little contact since. I never thought that this was the cause of my trauma, but the more therapy I do and the deeper I get in my work, I'm realizing it certainly could be part of why I constantly yearn for acceptance and need validation. I also was always rejected in high school and felt very alone and unwanted and wonder if that would be a source of my adult trauma and patterns of bad pics of women. The woman I'm into, let's call her Julie, is the daughter of a functioning alcoholic mother and a cop dad who was barely around, married to the job and always getting as much overtime as possible. I believe she has many dismissive avoidant tendencies from the numerous YouTube videos and books I've read on the attachment styles and from how we interact with each other. We've known each other for roughly 10 years, but only been good friends for maybe three and a half now. Julie is the granddaughter of my boss and I'm an outsider at a family owned restaurant. She's 10 years sober off of heroin addiction and met her, quote, soulmate in rehab. She stayed clean. He did not. He died of an overdose in 2020, mm. leaving her with two children. About six months after he died, I met her at the gym and we started texting, eventually leading to very flirty texting, including pictures. The mutual attraction was clearly there, but I knew I was in a weird place as her boyfriend and soulmate had just died roughly six months earlier. I didn't want to come off like a creep, but I was super interested in her and I could feel that she was feeling the same way with me. We had a talk one day that essentially laid the groundwork for friends with benefits when she was ready. So just sex. She said I was someone she felt comfortable with and when the time was right, she could see that that as a possibility. Hmm. We continued flirtatious texting until she stopped getting a hold of me out of the blue. It turns out that her boyfriend's best friend came up to visit and check on her and the kids from another state halfway across the country. They ended up sleeping together, quote, one time and getting pregnant. She would later tell me that she stopped communicating with me because she was ashamed. He ended up never going back home. About six months after the new baby was born, I had since moved on because I had no choice. She told me she wanted to come to one of my fitness classes as I was doing coaching at that time. Oh, she did, did she? Mm. <laughs> but she would be bringing this boyfriend with her. I was just her friend again at this point. Friend, friend, mm-hmm. So I said, I'll see you at class. And when the class was, aren't you cool? Aren't you a nice guy? <laughs> I know you know that. Okay. When the class was over, she gave me a big hug and whispered in my ear, I can't wait to, and he told me what it was. It's something explicitly sexual, very in your face. Apparently they were never, he says, apparently she and that boyfriend were never in a relationship. She told me they just were co-parents, even though he had feelings for her. They were not mutual. The plot gets messier, huh? I can only assume seeing me in a confident place in my life, running the class and showing confidence, made her realize she still wanted at least a physical relationship with me. So after a little time, we started what, we would, what would be a six or so month friends with benefit period. She would then tell me she couldn't keep, this, keep doing this because she was starting to catch feelings for me. 
I said I was happy with the way things were, but in my head, I knew this was because I was still mad at her for picking him over me to sleep with originally when I thought we were starting to build something genuine. Well, you're starting to get your experience with this woman, aren't you? And then I found out she sleeps with this guy. We weren't dating, huh, we weren't dating. So I couldn't say she cheated on me or anything, but she wasn't upfront at the time. She was entertaining the thought of sex with anyone else either. She would tell me it had been so long since the boyfriend died and she felt this new guy was a safe, no strings partner since he was going back home halfway across the country until they got pregnant. Anyway, after a fun run, I let her slip away and we decided to end friends with benefits because we didn't want to ruin the friendship. I vote a big question mark here. What you call friendship, we're going to come back to, all right? Ruin the friendship. We had, and we didn't want to ruin the friendship we had, and it was starting to get weird, and the feelings getting involved. So we moved on. Isn't that funny? Like, actually feeling for somebody is like the, the bad thing. Like, you start to view it like the toxin. Oh, no, I care about them. Oh, poison. See, that's when you know you've been brainwashed by somebody manipulative, but we'll get to that. I started seeing someone else, a very recently divorced co-worker. Yes, I make horrible decisions. Yep. That's okay. That's a clue about you. I hope you don't run out of red ink on this. It's actually just a pencil. The pen is pink, but the, the pencil is gray. So don't worry. No red ink is involved. <laughs> just circles. And when Julie saw that I had moved on, she decided to give things a real try with the friend slash father to the third child. Both of these, quote, relationships went up in flames rather quickly, and we found ourselves back with each other, this time as friends again, consoling the other for picking bad partners. What do you think is going to happen? We'd spend a lot more time together in the coming weeks and months and eventually realized that we thought we wanted what we wanted was right under our noses the whole time. So while it wouldn't be right now, the friend dad had moved in with her during this period. I said right here, FFS. <laughs> So this is true love, but it won't start now because she lives with this other guy. We knew in the end we wanted to end up together. You know, like Roger, if you're hearing me read this, I'm hoping you can hear the madness in all of this. We knew in the end we wanted to end up together. Yeah, a bookmark. Uh, I'm not surprised she offered you a little bookmark there. I don't want to be with you now. I just want to toy with your heart and keep you on a leash right now. And then, you know, because the future, etc. So this went on for a few months until she abruptly told me she didn't see an end game for us, what we were calling it, and that while she loved me, she didn't have romantic love for me anymore. And you were devastated. He was devastated. Okay. I can't even count the number of like, she's into it. She's not into it. She's into it. She's not into it. We've since gone through a period of her pulling out of my life completely for about nine months because in her words, if I could remove myself from your life and allow you to find someone else, that's what I was going to do. But Roger says, I never moved on and kept trying to keep our friendship and hopefully more alive. Okay, so you held on. She was trying to move on, possibly out of concern and care for you, but I kind of doubt it. But it sounded good anyway, that it was for you. Eventually, she came back around telling me that seeing how dedicated I was to her showed her who I am, and we essentially picked up our quote, end game, where it had so abruptly left off. I should add, we hadn't had sex since the friends with benefit period, maybe because she was afraid to be that vulnerable again, or maybe she'd been active with her father, who knows. She tells me she's never lied to me, and that ever since they moved in together, they can't even stand to be around each other, and they're still just co-parents living in the same house. Okay, that's them, but here's you devoting your life to somebody who lives with another guy and leaves all the time. By now, that's, that's the thing that I'm hoping you can focus on. By now, in the last few months, she's pulled away again and again, told me she again sees no romantic future for us. She works, she's a mother of three with very little help, and she takes classes during the day, so she is burned out mentally and emotionally and physically. Adding in my constant anxious behavior ended up being too much. And I'm going to, I have another word for your anxious behavior is that you weren't perfectly agreeable to her always making you a, an occasional, you know what buddy, an F buddy. 
Now she barely reaches out at all. She's actually kind of mean to me when we do interact, even though when we do finally hang out, the connection feels strong. All right, I'm going to circle connection because I want to help you see what that actually is. I know she isn't good for me, so why do I feel so drawn to her? I should add that I also feel like I could save her. Oh, there you go. Okay. And feel so protective of her, seeing all she's gone through and how miserable she is. Huh. It's weird. Yeah. I think it's like you, but it's you. You're the one who's miserable and has gone through so much. I put her over myself at all costs, completely neglecting the needs I have. Yeah, good, honest. She's convinced me, or I've convinced myself more realistically, that my needs just don't matter. And there it is, the nice guy syndrome. What is wrong with me? I think you got it. When you said nice guy syndrome, um, I think you might be referring to that book, um, No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. And that's a good book. I recommend it to men who find themselves putting up with being treated quite badly by women and staying there trying to save them. It's a terrible place to be, and it's a, it's a terrible waste of your life and the very valuable gold of the love that you have to give to somebody out there that somebody would really love to have, but it's getting just thrown away on this woman who, I don't know what it is with her. She's a maybe she's a love and sex addict. Um, maybe she's just reacting to trauma, or maybe she has a disorganized attachment where she craves the relationship and then has to throw it away. I don't know, like we could psychologize her, but psychologizing people who are treating you like crap is a way for you to avoid being happy. It's a rationalization for why you should keep putting up with it or why you should keep hope alive. So you asked me in the beginning, why am I limerent and in love with someone I know is no good? So let's establish that. We agree. She's no good for you. And uh, she doesn't seem to be treating anybody very well. I keep thinking about these kids with this unstable mother who just is like jerking people around. And then this manipulation that you're sort of signing on to where she's like, oh, we're just friends or you go back to some friendship. But friends don't screw around with each other and then just push them away and manipulate them and lie, you know, suddenly they're sleeping with somebody else too. And that's not a friend. That's not friendship. That's not considerate at all. She's just taking, you know, in most contexts, I would call this person an emotional vampire or a romantic shoplifter. They're just taking this energy they want. And when she was bereaved and lost her partner, that's really serious. I don't recommend getting together with somebody very close to the death of somebody, especially in the way that her partner died, you know, through an overdose. Tragic, hideous, you know, very, it's, it's happened to, um, you know, I lost a partner that way. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, I sure would like to find somebody else to date. But I assure you, nothing that happened in the near aftermath of that death worked out at all well for me. It was a disaster, not a good time. So a good period of healing is what a person needs. Not that it's any of your business. So I'm going to sort of playfully call you out on this idea that you can save her. It's like, well, you're not doing a very good job <laughs> as her savior. You're not her savior. It's a weird thing that we do. We traumatize people where we, we can't seem to like turn that energy on ourselves and give it to ourselves. And you can psychologize it all you want, but nothing you can say about it really makes sense. It's just the way it is. We have trouble doing that. For some reason, we can give it to somebody else. It, and I wouldn't be surprised if it had to do with your mom becoming a single mom when you were seven and dealing with an alcoholic dad that you kind of adopted this idea. And I think that that type of experience is not uncommon in that book, No More, no More Mr. Nice Guy. Um, you know, that early on you sort of found that you could be a knight in shining armor. But, you know, it's BS. You're not. Nobody's a knight in shining armor. Even the people who are knighted have flaws and get divorced. <laughs> so it's, it's not really a thing. Like what a good person does is they work on themselves and they don't throw away their own happiness and their own stability for somebody who treats them badly. So I totally understand like what you're doing is such a normal, normal trauma symptom. But now, now you're free. Now the past is over and you get to change how you're handling this and you can set a new standard for yourself. You can stop allowing this to continue in your life by being self-disciplined about who you let in. So Roger, what I heard here is that 
there's a lot of drama around this woman and you're having trouble letting go. You know the right thing is to let go. And letting go means not just being friends. That's not a real thing. Uh, I know of people who have transitioned from romantic relationship to friendship, but nobody has feelings for the other one. That's why it works. That's why it works. It's not possible and it's sad but true. But the thing is, the minute you make that decision that you're not gonna have contact with her anymore, you you might cry for 45 minutes and then you will be free then you'll be free it'll be like oh wow the world just opened up again you can meet somebody new and stay away from the recently divorced people you can find somebody who has been single for a while who kind of knows who they are and they're not acting out sexually and they're not um you know telling lies or <laughs> manipulations about what it is they want or expect from you you won't have to do that you can just sincerely show up and date in an honest, sincere way about to see if this person, as you get to know them, is what you're looking for. And they for you. Oh, it's a good thing. It really works. But those of us who have spent a lot of time just sort of getting our hearts broken on a stormy sea of bullshit, we're not very good at it yet, or we have trouble believing that it can be better than that. But it immediately starts to get better when you set those boundaries. So you can set those boundaries, but you have to know what they are. You might want to try my dating course. I always have a link to that, Dating and Relationships for People with Childhood PTSD. It's my tough love course on how to get that part of your life together. And the link to that course is always in the description section and on my website, crappychildhoodfairy.com. But what I want to leave you with is the thing that's going to strengthen you to be able to make any changes, that's going to strengthen you to be able to say goodbye to this toxic relationship, and that is to feel happier. You need to be able to be happy. You need to be happy today, even when you're sad, even when you have to make hard decisions that are heartbreaking, that scare you. There needs to be a baseline of happiness and confidence that you know how to find those flashes of joy in your life. And so I wanna leave you with this list I made of 11 tips to lift your mood and feel happier right now. It's a free download. You can get it right there, and I will see you very soon.